Good morning and a blessed Sabbath to each and every one of you who are present here and who are worshiping along with us online. It is such a great privilege of ours to come together as a family, God's family, and worship him. And one of the ways that we can worship him is through our songs. So let's all turn our hymnals to hymn number 272. Uh, give me the Bible. That will be our first song, 272. For our next song, let's all turn our hymnals to hymn number 294, Par in the Blood, 294. There is power, power, wonder working power 
There's sunshine in my soul today. Hymn number 470 will be our next song. 470. There's sunshine in my soul today. More glory, yes, and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows a smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. The final stanza. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love. For blessings which He gives me now, for joys laid up above. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows His smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Sweet by and by will be our next song, 428. <clears throat> There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father is over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by We shall meet on the beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed And a spirit shall sorrow no more Not a sigh for the blessing of rest In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore to our mountain Father above We will offer a tribute of praise For the glorious gift of His love And the blessings that hallow our days In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by shall meet on that beautiful shore. Good morning. A very happy Sabbath to each one of you. In observing the Sabbath, one is both giving a gift to God and imitating Him. A world without Sabbath would be like a man without a smile, like a summer without flowers, and like a homestead without a garden. It is the most joyous day of the week. Keeping the Sabbath day holy is much more than physical rest. It involves 
spiritual renewal and worship. A life built upon Sabbath is contented because in rhythm of rest, we discover our time is full of the holiness of God. With these thoughts in mind, again, I wish you a very happy Sabbath and a warm welcome to each one of you present here and those who are watching on live broadcast. To begin the Sabbath school, let's all stand and sing hymn number 515, 515, the Lord is my light. reading for this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 24 verse 1. Genesis chapter 24 verse 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. May God bless his holy word. Shall we all bow our heads for prayer? Our merciful, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good night to rest and peaceful sleep. Thank you for your angels keeping watch over us, protecting us and keeping us safe and leading us to another day. We thank you for this beautiful Sabbath morning with the bright sunshine, for the gift of life that is that you have given us, which is ours in Christ Jesus. Dear Living Father, we thank you for giving us the privilege to come together in your holy sanctuary, dear Lord. Help us to realize that we are in your presence and that your presence is with us today. May your Holy Spirit take control of our, our thoughts, our actions, 
our deeds and our thought and our, and all our thinking dear lord may we all, whatever we do whatever we say may we bring glory and honor to your holy name bless our sabbath services today pray for every participant and all the members who have who have come and those who will be joining us soon we also pray for those who are watching and joined our our services this morning from their homes lord bless us all with uh, the sabbath blessings and keep us all faithful to you i pray in jesus precious name amen, amen. The future talk this morning. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of Rock Mountain Glory? Do you know what it is? Rock Mountain Glory. Is it a is it a mountain? Is it a plant or is it a desert? What do you think it is? Rock Mountain Glory. Well, I don't think you have heard this before. <laughs> the name of this rock mountain glory <clears throat> deserts are inhospitable places to survive to live within for human beings for animals and plants not all plants survive in deserts there are only few plants that are capable of surviving in deserts and not all animals can live in the deserts because of its um, blazing heat and uh, less rain it makes it difficult for uh, most of the life to live in deserts <clears throat> the days are hot and the nights are cold so it's not a pleasant uh, climate for for us to or uh, plants and animals to live there but there's one particular plant that can that survives in deserts and that plant is called the rock mountain glory <clears throat> this plant has <clears throat> large underground tubers resembling sweet potatoes that store water whenever it rains in times of drought it is sustained by the water stored in its in its 20 or so underground reserves sometimes we are like this desert we are in the desert and uh, and that can feel uh, quite desolate but if we store god's word in our hearts day by day pondering and trusting upon his precious promises we will have supernatural resilience. We will be able to survive. <clears throat> Let's see what the Bible has to say about, about uh, storing God's word in our heart. Proverbs, book of Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart unto understanding. So what is uh, God's word admonishing us to do? To store his words in our hearts. Receive his words and hide them in our hearts. Let's refer to another book. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 8. Je Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 8. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when, the, when heat cometh, but, let, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So that's what happens when we store our, um, incline our hearts to God's commandment, store them in our hearts and live by it. So we shall be like a plant that is by the waters or rivers or lakes. That's always green and that uh, leaves are green and always yield fruit. So 
let us learn to spend some time studying God's word and receive his commandments into our hearts and live by his commandments. And we will be able to share his, word, his words, his gospel to others. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's mission story is about a woman named Antonio, Antonia Miguel. She tells the story of how COVID-19 changed her life. She's always believed in God and started praying from a very young age for God to help her to find a good husband and who would go to church with her and share the same beliefs as her. But the big question was which church would they attend? As a child, she attended church with her parents in Angola, and she faithfully followed its rituals. But something seemed to be lacking inside. Something seemed to be missing. After she got married to a wonderful husband, she moved to a church, and then four years later, she moved to another church. But she still felt empty inside. And what she heard at church didn't seem to match with her personal life. She wasn't sure that God had forgiven her sins. She wasn't sure that he was transforming her character into his likeness. And also, her husband didn't go to church with her either. In 2020, the whole church went into lockdown because of COVID-19 pandemic, and the churches were closed. And she could no longer attend um, worship services. So she looked for sermons online and on YouTube, and she found two programs conducted by the Seventh-day Adventist pastors on the Hope Channel television. As she watched, she carefully compared their Bible verses with her own Bible, and she realized that she did not know the Bible at all. What especially caught her attention was the observance of the seven-day Sabbath in the Bible. As she watched, it seemed, like, it seemed like one of the pastors had spoken to her directly, and he said, who do you want to follow, the dictates of men or the word of God as expressed in the Bible? And this question really bothered her greatly. And from the depths of her heart, she responded, I want to follow what my God has said in his word. And she remembered when she was living um, in one of her uh, homes, she had hi hired a, a woman to help her around the house. And when the woman first started working, she would work through Friday and took off Saturdays. And she explained to An Angolia that she went to the Seventh-day Adventist church on Saturdays. But after a while, she stopped going to church, and she worked for her on Saturdays as well. And when Angolia became aware of the importance of the Sabbath, she spoke to the young woman. She said, you are not going to church anymore, but you are willing to work at my house on Saturdays. If you stop going to church because of your work for me, think again. From now on, you will only work Monday through Friday and have Saturdays off because Saturday is holy. By that point, the pandemic restrictions had eased and the young woman was able to go to church and today she is taking baptism, baptismal classes in preparation for her baptism. Meanwhile, Angolia wanted to know more about the Sabbath and she called an Adventist pastor whose phone number she had found online. He was friendly and offered her several books to read and she began worshiping, worshiping on Sabbath and was baptized in 2021. She says, today I am a new person, and the transformation is continuing to take place daily. I know God forgives my sins. I know he is transforming my character into his likeness. Join me in praying for my husband to know God and to be able to go to church with me every Sabbath. Part of this 13th Sabbath offering will help establish four projects in Antonia's home country in Angola, including a seven-day Adventist school in Luanda, an Adventist church and an elementary school in the city of Belize, a domestic violence and counseling center in the city of Lombe, and a men's dormitory at the Adventist University of Angola in the city of Huambo. Thank you for planning a generous offering. At this time, the missions offering will be collected, and as it is being collected, we will be favored by a special song by my mom, Sadna, and I. The song that we are going to sing is a Hindi song. The song says, come, see, my Jesus is alive. 
he will perform all kinds of miracles because he is God Almighty. closing prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us, dear Lord. We thank you especially for another day of life. I thank you so much for bringing us all here together to come and worship you and praise your name. Those who are here, those who are on their way, and those who are online, dear Lord. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to come here and to praise your name and to learn more and more about you, dear Lord. I ask that you be with the um, with Joseph Jerome as he's going to bring us the lesson study and help it to uh, be a blessing to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy Sabbath. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for bringing us through another week. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for knowledge and understanding of your word. We pray, Father, for, for your Holy Spirit. We pray for your spirit to do well here in our hearts and our mind. And I pray for those who are on their way. In Jesus' name, amen topic this week is the promise and we're picking it up from Gen Genesis 24 verse 1 and it says now Abraham was old well advanced Abraham was old well advanced in age and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things When I was reading this study this morning, I mean this week, what I realized when you, you hear of a promise, the first thing crosses my mind is the Messiah is to come. How important is it for this promise with Abraham and Isaac to take place? Finally, through a study this week, there was some question raised, and I just want to bring it to you guys, and let me hear some of your thoughts, because I don't know if you guys know or have learned how to play dominoes, and did God himself uses or moves certain things in history just to make this thing happen with Abraham to bring about Isaac. It's just a question I want to throw out there since we're talking about the promise because we have seen some of the things that have taken place and we know through the 12 tribes lies the Messiah and Without the Messiah, there is what you call a Christian faith. There's no hope, right? But did Isaac have to play a role here? And that's the question I just want to hear. I'm, ho I'm hoping that you guys have read the Sabbath school lesson, which is pretty interesting. And I just want to, I just want to put that out there, if you have any thoughts on that. Please help me out. Any thoughts on this? That God plays a role about bringing Isaac in the picture. Do they believe in predestination? Do they believe in predestination? Do we believe in predestination? And, and exactly, Elder, that's, that's, that was the topic we had this week because I, w I was trying to explain this in a way where they, they, those who were listening could understand that the scripture said that God knew you while you were in your room, right? In the, at the same time, 
if that's the case, that's, that's what I brought out. If that's the case, then why are we still here? If God could go ahead and fix and change things, why are we still here in this wretched world? And so, even, even, even when, when it had to be done the right way, right? Ishmael came on the scene, but was he the promise? And the promise mean it have meaning it have to be done the right way. And if 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 it's not being done the right way, then guess what? God have to keep working on this thing, but he cannot intervene. Because if God intervened in, in our salvation, everything else, then what will the entire universe will look at this thing and say? You know, and, and this is where, okay, when God took Ishmael, remember there was problem in the home, and they decided to leave. Well, God himself sent angels to bring him back. And the reason is, the way God's system works, it's perfect. Ishmael needed a father in the home. And he needed that in order to go forward in life, period. Okay? Comparing to Isaac, who came on the scene, he was the promised child. He was the child that would lead the way. Right? So when you go back and you, and you study the, 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 the life of Isaac, what have Isaac done? What have he done? I mean, all the Bible talks about he dug wells, and those wells were way before he, you know, he came on the scene. He just helped redo the problem, the, the situation. But there's nothing about Isaac besides the time when you hear Isaac Jacob and Esau, that, that problem there. But you don't see or any conflict with Isaac in Isaac's life. It just happened that Isaac was just the perfect child. It, it's, it's, it's as though God, God makes sure he went through a proper training. And, and the reason is he had to have a father in his life that would lead him. And again, I see young men young women carrying nine millimeters, machine guns on the street, the answer is right there. There's no father in the home. 12 years old, 13 years old, carrying guns. They don't have a father in the home. But God makes sure Isaac had that blessing. Any thoughts, any comments that you want to bring out? foundation and God will not force his will on people because of he has given the power of choice amen power of choice yeah, if that's so you could have destroyed the devil Lucifer when he sinned <laughs> amen he is God all powerful but God is love we just cannot understand the depth and height and width and all that for eternity but God is merciful, and God has set upon him that is godly for himself. And when we call upon him, he will hear us. When we follow him, making our choice. Thank you, Elder. Thank you. Now let's move on to Sunday's lesson. Mount Moriah. Genesis 22, 1 to 12. I will read this, and, um, and let's pick up from this story, because we, we find out that God had called men and women. A lot of us, we think that you have to be perfect 
in order to come to Christ. But if you were perfect, why need to come to Christ? Right? So we are living in a time where you can't even, the, the cloth is overshadowed, I'll be honest with you. A lot of traditions is going on. You actually have to read the gospel for yourself, personally, to understand what lies ahead or what's to come and, and the mystery of godliness. How can it impact my life and how can it going to impact your life? So now, we see Abraham was not a perfect man. God called him out of a heathen country. And God said, you are going to be the one that will, through you, my covenant is going to come out. My, I will build my covenant and my promises. And through, through Abraham, we saw the problem Abraham went through. But yet, God was still with him. And I just want to share this with you because we are living in a time some are jobless. Some you probably had just lost a loved one. And yet you cannot see Christ beyond measure. I want to let you know, continue to hold on. Don't go by your feelings. Do not go by your emotions. You have to hold on. This thing is coming. It's, it's going to close out. But again, while I was reading this, I, the whole thing crosses my mind is, I want to see where this 140 and 4,000 is going to come through. Where, when, when, is it gonna when, they, when is this group going to show up? You don't know. I don't know, right? But we have to hold on. Even if, if just say it's, your son is going to be part of, your, your daughter is going to be part of this 140 and 4,000. So you are here for a reason, right? So your goal is to make sure that they get the proper training. That will lead and close this earth history with this sin issue. But we have to trust in God. Regardless, based on my emotions, my feelings has nothing to do with it. You go to bed with one feeling, you get up with another in the morning. But the principle is continue to stay firm with the word of God. And I, I excuse me, Abraham knew the promise. He held on to it. Regardless of his situation, his problem, but he still held on. He did not give up in this thing. So let's read. Genesis chapter um, 20 to the 22nd chapter says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thine son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and give it thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then one of the third day, then on the third day, Abraham lift up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Have you wondered and say, well, wait a minute now. Didn't Sarah have a, play, a role to play in this? How come, he did, how come he didn't wake her up in the morning and talk to her about this situation? Let me hear some of the mothers out here. Okay, what would be your, what would be your thought? Your husband wakes you up in the morning and said, I'm going to offer this this guy up, your son, mind you, your only son, okay? At least we can say Abraham had Ishmael before, right? But your only son, and I'm going to offer him as a sacrifice unto God because God tells me so. What would, go, what would be going through your mind? You know? Oh, no, I, I think... are, they, are you out of your mind? <laughs> your, you know, your only son. And, and so 
again, this is, this is the key. We have, to, we have to look at this thing beyond measure, beyond what it is, because you, God has a way of working in your life. He has a way of working into my life. That's why I tell people, even though you go into your grave, it does not matter. The gospel is still moving on, right? But in the resurrection, just believe that God is going to wake you up in the resurrection. That's a beautiful thing, man. I'm telling you, this is a beautiful, beautiful. This gospel is so beautiful to me. It gives me hope. Okay, the minute you get up in the morning, don't you know why you're sleeping at night? The devil is fighting to take your life. It is God who's protecting you. That's the blessing of it all. We worship this God beyond measure, meaning we don't have a clue what's going to come out tomorrow. But we do know if we believe and trust in him, his promises will come to pass. Go ahead, Elder. I just had a thought. Sarah trusted Abraham fully, I think. This is my opinion as I read the scripture. She has all called him Lord. Though he had told lie to the king, you know, she said, oh, I'm glad they did not do anything to me and return. She trusted in him. And mm -hmm. then just like I tell my wife, uh, I'm going, I'll be back. You see? And she knows I'll be back. Just like that, I think, she said, we will be back. We will be back. So she said, okay. But she didn't ask, where are you going? What are you going to do? I said, I'll be back. Don't worry. The trust. The trust. The trust. So also Abraham trusted and took his journey to Mount Moriah. And knowingly the faith, the promise, God will have a plan. I El did not have a son, but he gave me a son. Elder, let me ask you a question yeah. though. <laughs> say you're dear wife. <laughs> what is that? Say, say, say you get up in the morning yeah. and you tell your dear wife you might not be back. Would she have a concern about that? She would have a thousand questions to ask you. <laughs> what do you mean you're not coming back? If right? And so what, basically what I'm saying is that in calamities, in yes. trials, this is what reveals character. Go ahead, my sister. I, I think Abraham trusted God and he knew that he would come through for him. Yeah. I mean, he obeyed uh, God. But I think Abraham knew that God would provide. Abraham knew that yes. God would provide. But that, that relationship did not come overnight, right? Oh, yeah. Because we saw some of the defect in Abraham's life. And now we see now he's getting to that point where now he's just going to get up. Now we're going to bring this up. Why? Why, why did at, the, at that time God bring this test upon Abraham, right? Any thought, comment? My sister have a... On the right. I want to put a spot on Sarah because she was the mother of Isaac. And uh, being the mother, she has a big part in making a decision, right, uh, about Isaac. So Abraham not telling her about what he was going to do meant that she was going to stop Abraham from offering Isaac. That's why he did not tell her. So, yeah, that's, I mean, as a mother, if Abraham, if my husband would tell me, I'm going to sacrifice our son because God told me to do so. <laughs> I mean, I would understand Abraham doing that because he's got a relationship with God and he knew that it was God's voice talking to him that this is something that he has to do. But on Sarah's part, you know, I, uh, from what I had read on uh, the Bible about her, her faith is not really as strong as her husband. I would not say that she doesn't have faith, but it was not as strong as Abraham. So, you know, when the angel told her that she was going to, you know, uh, deliver a son, she even laughed because... She said that, how could that be? I'm already beyond my years, right? Mm -hmm. So the doubt was there. So that's the reason why Abraham had to keep what he was going to do to her because he knew that she was going to get in the way. Mm -hmm. As a mother, I would freak out. 
I mean, I carried this child for nine months in my in my belly, and then just to be, you know, sacrificed like that. And, and not, not only that you carry her for nine months, but the experience yes. of bringing this child out yes, exactly. on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is a very interesting topic. One, one more thought here. Uh, Abraham knew that God will provide. No. Well, so when the question is, uh, I mean... Why he did not tell, we are talking about uh, two people, a uh, man and a woman here. Why he did not tell that he was going to sacrifice her own son, nine months, whatever it is. It is true. I mean, we are human beings. We are not gods in the sense. But God has been bringing both of them together in their journey. And she got the son by promise. As though she had made a mistake. Asking Abraham to go to Hagar. But they also, the character was being built depending upon God all the time. God will provide. That's why when the question asked, where fire is there, wood is there, but where is the lamb? He said, God will provide. That was in his heart. And God provided. See, we cannot see at the beginning, we cannot know the end, but God knows end from the beginning. He reveals step by step. Amen. And in the scripture says, and Abraham took the wood of burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac and his son, and he took the fire in his, in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Father, my father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself. I just want you to understand the emphasis on this. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son. Now, mind you, Spirit of Prophecy said, Ab Isaac was so obedient unto God. He actually was helping his father tie him up to get on the altar. Remember, Isaac, I mean, excuse me, Abraham was an old man. Okay? Isaac was like almost like a grown, built man. So he would need that help. But look, there were not like, he didn't even question what his father was doing, right? It tells me. the time we live in, that our only job on, in, is to allow God to do his thing within us, right? It says, him that started this work, he will finish it. Go ahead, my brother. Oh, in Genesis, we don't see much details about what was going through Abraham's mind. But in the book of Hebrews, Paul brings out this fact. He says in verse Chapter 11, verses 17 and 18. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom, okay, and then it says, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. So Abraham, he believed that if he goes ahead, God can still bring him up from the dead to fulfill his promise. So Abraham believed in the resurrection, and that gave him the confidence. There was no resurrection of the dead till that point of time. I mean, a resurrection took place only later. There was no resurrection, and so Abraham believed in the resurrection and went ahead. Amen. But God intervened and saved him. Amen. Any more comment, thoughts? On this, since we're moving forward, an angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, this is verse 10 of 20, the 22nd chapter, call unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou have anything, unto, um, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thine son 
thine only son from me. Here's the question for you, right? Because I've read this over and over again. If God knows everything, why is he saying, now I know? Uh, Go ahead. God always gets down to our level and talks in our language. And uh, it also says it repented God. He uses human, human language. Yes, and I just want to add also that um, God wants to show Abraham himself that so Abraham can acknowledge that God knows that he knows Abraham's heart. You know, he, he, you know, yes, he says, now I know. But he wants also that, to show Abraham that he knows, that Abraham knows that God knows his heart. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Now, if you guys, okay, because I've read this story over and over and over and over again, right? And it didn't hit me. I want to read it to you again, and let's, go in, let's, let's read it together here, right? Let's pick it up from verse 10, chapter 22, verse 10. It says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord, not God, you with me? The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, He I am. And he said, lay not the hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thine son, thine only son, from me. Now, when I go back and I study, again, this is what the spirit of prophecy is giving to us. So we would not go into guess game. Because if we go into guess game, then you know what will happen? which we already seen is taking place, right? The Seventh-day Adventist church start having little sec. They, they, they move away from us. Why? Because God has given us the spirit of prophecy in these last days to move. Because the church was supposed to be in a movement, really, to be honest, not a church, right? It's when we read the spirit of prophecy, we are told, based on what Ellen White saw, because the church in 1800 had rejected the righteousness by faith. And she says one, 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 one thing. She said, I saw that we will be here a little longer than expected. So now we're in 2022, right? Moving towards 23, 24, 25. And with that being said, I've seen chaos upon chaos has taken place. I'm telling you. You cannot leave your house to so say you're going to the grocery store safe. So it's bad enough you can't do that now. Then you're going to walk out the house without praying? Pray. Even moving that car before you even put it on, <laughs> just pray. Ask God to lead you. So now <clears throat> we, we, we are... In this position now, I think the spirit of prophecy says, is not for his own good alone, but for the intelligence of for the intelligence of the angelic hosts, meaning this is found in patriarchs and prophets. There were questions raised among the angels. Why are you going to trust this man to lead out your nation? Because we have seen him sin time and time and time again. And right back, Elder. God had reached a point where Abraham is now sealed, and he said, try him. Try him. And that, this is where the scripture comes in. Now I know that thou will not hold thine only son from me, because everything in life, how God is going to bring you out of this thing here without going through something in life. You know, the trial and the tribulations. How in the world can you go and you witness to someone about God if you have not gone through nothing? And this is why I say about Isaac. Isaac didn't go through nothing. It's when, we, when a, um, Jacob and Esau comes on the scene, we begin to see the battle, and we begin to see how he handled the situation. 
and it wasn't cute. Any thought, comments for Sunday's lesson before we move on? Now, Monday's lesson says God will provide, and that's what the angel said. God will provide himself a lamb. I'm um, excuse me. I um, Abraham said God will provide himself, meaning everything was ready in place for Jesus to take place of this thing here on my behalf, on your behalf. And this is why I say this is not by accident. And the question came, and again, this is why the question came. I, I raised the question up earlier that God himself plays a role in bringing Isaac into this picture because we see how protected Isaac were in his entire life. You know, even when it comes down picking a wife for him. And this is Monday, it says there at Mount Moriah. Now, remember, you know where Mount Moriah at? If you go back and you study, um, I think it's, it's Matthew 24 when they came to Jesus and said, Master, tell us, where I tell us, when shall the end time come? And he gave him a warning, when ye shall see the abomination set up, when he was talking about AD 70. Remember, Tecture came in with his army, the Romans' army, and he set this thing straight by setting up little pagan gods around the mount, right around Jerusalem, right down the mount, that was Mount Moriah. That was considered holy, holy place, because of this, this, this experience here. That's, that's, that's the history behind this, this, this thing here. Everything has a history behind it. Any thought, comments on Monday's lesson? And it says, God will provide. And he called this place Jehovah Jireh, meaning God will provide. And again, this is the beauty about it when you trust God based on his promises, right? There are some things that are supposed to be taking place in your life, and you waited, and you waited, and you waited, it didn't come through. Guess what? Continue waiting. Sometimes you might not be able to fulfill in your life. And that's why I said there are a lot of mothers. If you praying for this hoodlum son who's on running the streets and you can't get him to church, you don't need to stress yourself out, but get on your knees, constant prayer, constant prayer. And Sister White says, just before he get out the most holy place, Jesus hands the Father a note. And some of the notes are the prayers of the mothers. God is going to make sure, even though if we go in, we whisper a word of prayer, we ask God to fulfill this promise to us, right? And we go into our graves, God's still going to answer that prayer. Because you prayed by faith. And that's what I want to let you guys know. Hold on to this thing. It's a faith thing. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a faith thing. We're about to take the offering. Just go ahead, Mama. God always provides. The problem is our unbelief that hinders him from providing. That's the only obstacle. If we have faith... God will always provide and make a way. Amen. Amen. Because of the sake of time, I just want to jump into Wednesday's lesson for a minute. Because Tuesday's lesson is talking about the death of Sarah, right? And we know that the death has caused a lot of grief in Abraham's life, also in Isaac's life. Now, here's a question I want to raise out there. Why was it so important that Isaac had to find his son a wife? Excuse me, sorry. Why Abraham had to find his son a wife? Thank you. Any thought, comments on that? Yeah. 
Remember now, Isaac trusted his father so much that he wanted that. Are we raising our kids today to have that kind of trust in us as parents? Can I gradually say that? Can I say that I'm raising my kid, my son, that he's going to trust everything I say, everything I do. He's gonna look at my behavior and he's gonna look at me as a role model and he's going to trust me. Can, can ask that question, ask yourself that question because Isaac now is in a position now he's, he wants a wife. And we see Abraham is telling, making sure that he does not take a wife outside of the family. Today we will call that incest. But why? Why did Abraham wanted that to take place? Because today we are told, when I joined the church, I was told I, I was supposed to take a wife within the Seventh-day Adventist church. And the reason is, I cannot mix myself with unbelievers, right? But we, as the church, emphasize so much on that to the point where the divorce rate is so high within the Seventh-day Adventist church. What seemed to be the problem? What, what, what went off? Did I go off as a parent? I just want to hear your thoughts here. And you don't need to get personal. Just give me what, based on what's your thought, what, what, what are you thinking about that when you hear this, these things takes place? Because when we come into the church, the church was supposed to be in something that refined, you know, everything life within the church. But when the divorce rate is so high within the church, in the world, then there's a problem. I just want to hear your thought. What is the problem? We raise our kids. We send them to Adventist school. Mind you, that, this thing is not cheap. Sending your kids to, to Adventist Christian school is not cheap. And by then, you're trying to find the money to send them to college. Oakwood, Andrews, you name it. Anyway, right? So they, so they can keep up with the faith, right? You hoping that they have a relationship with Christ, right? But once they done, they get their education, they get the good jobs, guess what happened? They don't come to church. They stop coming to church because they found more, what's more interested out there is the money making, the big home, and you name it, so and so and so. So by the time you look, it's 2022. Who's going to finish the work? That's why I said earlier, it's going to take somebody special. This group is going to come on the scene, and I want to know where this group is coming from. I have a hand over there, my sister. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Amen. Yes? Amen. That's train up a child in the way he should go. So he's growing up knowing the principles, the Adventist principles, everything, and, you know, more chances that they don't mess up in their life. Amen. Because I know this sister. Sister said, the mistake I made, I raised my kids the Adventist way. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. And so today, none of them is in the faith. And she confessed. She says, I should have raised them to know Jesus, and everything will fall into place. See, when you raise them to know Jesus, there are young men, young women in the church who are not converted, and that's who you're giving your son to. This is who you're giving your daughters to. And by the time you look, they're no longer in the faith. So train them, teach them, educate them about Jesus. Everything else will fall into place that God asks. Amen? Let us close. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your blessings. 
continue to abide with us throughout this day. And Father, educate us moment by moment, day by day, that we may know and understand and have trust in your promises for us and our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to you and welcome to the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are so happy that you could join with us on this warm summer morning. This morning I would like to read a verse found in Hebrews 4.16 which reads, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. As we go throughout this week, let us remember that God is always ready to show mercy and grace to us if only we ask it of him. I would like to remind you that we at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church are so blessed by all of you who join with us to worship our God. We need your prayers and support, and we thank God for those of you who are already doing so. We urge you to continue supporting the ministries of this church, both through prayer and contribution, specifically the media ministry, who thanks you for your support. Your prayers, comments, and letters are what keeps us going, and we depend 100% on God's blessings and your generous giving. With your support, we can move together to spread this great message of God and his gospel to the entire world. Using his wisdom that he gives us, there are endless possibilities on how we can use the technology that we have for his glory. Tell your friends and families about your media ministries here at this church. And subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to join us this evening for our praise and prayer service. That will be at 5 p.m. That's 5 o'clock p.m. this evening. You can join with us to sing praises to our God and offer prayers to Him on the behalf of others. You can join that via YouTube, Zoom, Facebook, and even here in person. Please send in your requests. Today's message will be brought to us by Pastor Sajjan John. Once again, I thank each one of you for joining us, and now let me take you back to our sanctuary. is going to be our next song.
286. Wonderful words of life. 286.
358, in number 358, far and near the fields are teeming. Rescue the Perishing is going to be our next song. We'll do only the first stanza. happy I think <laughs> okay it's nice to be in the Church of God I'm here to ask you all to sponsor a Bible question before I go to the family who sponsored our Bible question for this week I would I saw a quote this morning I was so much impressed it says we are not in prison we are not in hospital we are not in the mortuary so be thankful to God that's true right we have so much to be thankful to God. Some of us have health issues. Still, we are breathing. We are able to breathe in and breathe out, right? God has given us so much to live for. Let's be thankful to God. And thank you, Mr. Mohanjan. And with those thoughts, I would like to request each one of you to please sponsor a Bible question to support this church, OK? The family who sponsored our Bible question today is Sadna and Vijay Jaladi. This family has been blessed so much by God. They have a handsome grandson, two beautiful daughters, and two handsome son-in-laws. Okay, God really blessed this family with so much blessing. And it's their wedding anniversary. Um, Sadhana told me to tell the number of years, but Vijay doesn't want us to tell. So, so in thankful, to thank God for their wedding anniversary, their 
giving $500 to sponsor a Bible question. And I hope and praise God for this family and let God give them many more wedding anniversaries. Let's come to the Bible question. Okay, it's not very tough. It's an easy one and I know some of you will answer. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I thought everybody knew this. This is a very famous psalm. Yeah, I'm giving you a little hint. We have a lot of Bible scholars in our audience. Okay, let me tell you. It's Psalm 100. Four to five, it's actually a song. This full Psalm 100 is a song. Many people sing it. Thank you all for helping us in donate, uh, sponsoring a Bible question every week. God bless you all. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Just a couple of quick um, reminders. One of them is in the bulletin. Um, this coming Mon not Monday, May 30th, which is Memorial Day, we're going to have our first church picnic on campus. Um, I'd like to invite all of you, and of course, you know, I'll be hitting you all up for food. Um, just to let you know, it's the first time we're going to try it on campus, see it, how it works out. Um, we're going to have a moon bounce, we'll have the gym open, we're going to have table tennis, carom boards, we're going to have everything here. So, um, we hope you will join us. So that's Monday, Memorial Day, May 30th, and 9 till 5, and we hope you can join us. Secondly, I just want to make an announcement. It's not This one is not in the bulletin. Um, it's from the VBS um, group. So... This year, our dates for VBS is July 18 to 23. And again, it will be in the evenings from 6 p.m. to 9 o'clock. And uh, we have registration forms for both um, children to attend as well as volunteers. Rachel has forms, so does Sarika and Seth. Um, I don't know if they are any, if you want to want an application or registration form, raise your hand. They'll bring it to you, or you can see them after church. All right? Thank you very much. Good morning, and happy Sabbath, everyone. Okay. Do you know that the number one cause of death in our country is, is our diet? Yes, chronic disease is an epidemic which is diet driven and hypertension is one of them. You know, Lauren Melton looked healthy but her blood pressure told a different story. She shares what adopting a plant-based diet did for her hypertension. Listen to her story. Four years ago, I was diagnosed with an unexplained, extremely high blood pressure. This news was quite shocking and unbelievable to me, as I had none of the typical contributing factors you expect for hypertension. I didn't smoke. I wasn't a heavy drinker. I wasn't overweight. I didn't lead a sedentary lifestyle. I thought, surely this can be true. What I believed, what I ate, I believed was healthy. I exercised regularly. What gives? Searching for answers, I begin visiting many specialists, including cardiologists and internal medicine physicians. And I even became a patient at the Vanderbilt Hypertension Clinic. I sought answers as to the why of this chronic illness. But after many tests and visits, all the specialists could tell me was that my condition must be the result of bad genes. Can you imagine? This is 
This news was devastating, to say the least. There I was, 30 years old, being told that I'd have to be on blood pressure medicine for the rest of my life, and that I'd have to endure a much higher risk of developing even deadlier conditions, including type 2 diabetes, heart attack, heart disease, and or stroke. I spent the last four years attempting to manage my condition as best as I could, trying to stay positive and dealing with medication side effects. And then I watched the documentary, Forks Over Knives. I was blown away by the research on the connection between various chronic illnesses and the typical American diet. Based on what I learned, I decided to give a plant-based diet a try. Within just a few weeks, my blood pressure completely normalized. I no longer needed medication at all. I find incredible that no physician or specialist had ever discussed the potential for reversing my hypertension with this type of dietary approach. I am now healthier than ever before. I, am more, I have more energy, my skin is clearer, and my blood pressure is finally back to normal. You know, friends, doctors do a very good job at controlling most diseases, but it is truly lifestyle that cures many diseases. You know, Mrs. White tells us in uh, Ministry of Healing, page 296, grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our creator. These foods, prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible, less to no oil and uh, less salt, you know, as pos uh, simple as possible, are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength, a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. You know, friends, when you and I make small changes in our lives is when we can make a big difference. May God bless us all. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each one of you. I extend a warm welcome to all friends and visitors who are visiting with us today and worshiping with us. I'm sure God has richest blessings in store for you. And all those who are worshiping with us online from all over the world, a special welcome to you as well. I'm sure God has uh, a special blessings for you. I have a number of announcements. You can find them at the back of the bulletin. Today, the praise and prayer service will meet at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Praise and praise service at 5 p.m. today. Also, the church board will meet next week, that is 28th May, uh, in the church fellowship hall at 8 p.m. Board meeting next Saturday at 8 p.m. We have uh, juicy mangoes, and uh, I urge you to buy uh, these mangoes because these are for a good cause, and the, all the proceeds that we raise by selling these juicy mangoes will support the church building fund. The social committee has planned annual picnic right in the church campus. That is on May 30th. Good food, fun, and uh, uh, fellowship. Please plan to, plan to come on May 30th for the church picnic. The annual camp is uh, booked for July 27 to 31, and uh, uh, 
if you have, uh, please uh, block, those num block those dates for church camp that is to take place in Laurel Lakes, Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful place surrounded by mountains. You will have good food and uh, fun for all. Please contact our church uh, men. Uh, they contact uh, Nagesh Beckham and uh, Joash Benjamin. Their uh, uh, mobile numbers are listed in the back of the bulletin. Now I ask you to cast all your cares and concern aside because the Lord is in his temple. Even the disciples wondered, what manner of person is this? Even the wind and the raging sea obeys his voice. I tell you, is the King of kings, Lord of lords, God of all gods, a mighty one in heaven and in earth? He is in his temple. Let's all keep silence.
Please be seated. Good morning, happy Sabbath church. Hope everyone's doing well today. And good morning, happy Sabbath to everyone online. Now is the time once again in our service that we have the opportunity to intercede for one another, lift each other up in prayer. Uh, today we have seven sealed silent prayer requests. For anyone who wants to submit a silent, pra sealed prayer request, uh, there's a drop box in the back in the lobby. Let's continue to please pray for Paulette Warren, for Maxwell Paul and family, Babu Benjamin, Dr. and Mrs. C.P. Matthew, Sudha Pillai, Rajani Purashottam, Lizia Ruldas, Pratap and Isaac, Lalita, Kishore, Maya, Mr. and Mrs. Aruldas, Emil John, Janet Smith, Esther Singh and family, Mervyn Singh, Lakshmama Beckham, Meheret, Shashi, Masi and family, Amy Leitner, John Gorde, Esther Gorde, Nirmala Chavan, Bridget Abraham, Lizzie Abraham, Sampat Kumari, Rasni Agam, Aman, Jayanti Eswarao, Edwin Joseph, Pastor Sajan and family, Pastor Reggie and Maria Samuel, Ellen Cromwell, Jesse and family, Tanya and Linda, Jeremy Moses, Shantaraj and family, Dr. Sam, Christopher Cole, Zebada and family, Mary Edwards, Richard Jeffries, Bluncha Florence, Karen and Gerald, Angie Abraham, Braxton, Annie Matthew, Brian and family, Philomena and Grace, Uma, Rosa and family, for Harut, Johnson Christian, Rita Nita, Aruna and Isaac Chavan, Dorothy Patrickson, for Arush, Maya Foster, Gracie Joel, David Raj, Yomi, Diane Hampton, Benjamin Atala and family, CM Sharma, Prakash, Darren King, Joshua Samuel, Sonia Barmi, Chandra Jason and family, Nadine and Justin, Shirley Harris, Remya, Jerry Smith, Elliot Jeffrey, Julia and family, Prema, Elsie Bowen, Robert's family, Alden Das, Geraldine Lee, Prince Almeida, Kalpana Kamble and family, Elaine Webster, the Remnant Youth and all Remnant Ministries, Justin Runji and family, Alice, Samira Rezahi, Terry McCoy, Raju in India, Deva Prasad and Pauline Kokila, Krishna Ben Patel for the suffering in Ukraine, Victor, Angela, additionally for Nagesh Beckham and family, for Seema Sate, Kidist, Meheret's sister, um, for Robin and Praveen Peter, for Harry, for Nathan, Babita, Diamond, and Moli Nutlapati. Additionally, I want us to all remember our brothers and sisters who are worshiping with us online from many different parts of the world. Let's remember to pray for Dow Taylor and family, Ponzi and family, and uh, son Mwansa and friend Gray, for Ruth Richmond and grandchildren, for Kenva Allen, for Cordelia Castornia, to keep them all in our prayers. Now, if you would please kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. for this privilege to worship you. We come before you, Lord, with bended knees, our hearts open to you, asking for your spirit to fill our lives, to fill our hearts, to fill our minds, to fill this sanctuary and wherever your children are worshiping, fill the place, Lord, with your divine presence. For in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, we do not want to leave your presence at any time, Lord. Because there is so much of peace and love in your presence. And I pray, Father, as we worship you today, may you pour the spirit of grace upon each one of us. Lord, you have heard the names that were read. 
They need divine intervention. They need your help. Each one is going through a different challenge. We lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help. Our help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. We know you alone, Lord, can help, can heal, can restore. We pray for the many broken families that you will bring healing. We pray for our young people who are struggling, Lord, to make decisions, that you would guide their thoughts, that they would make right choices. We pray, Lord, for many who are having financial challenges. You said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Open the windows of heaven, Lord. Oh Lord, we remember in a special way some of our brethren who need your help, your urgent help, Lord. You know each one of them. We pray for Elder Babu Benjamin. We pray for Auntie Lakshmama Beckham. We pray for John Gode. We pray for Jeremy. We pray for Sudha. Oh Lord, we pray for many, uh, Elder ML John. Lord, we pray for many others who have appointments in the hospital. You know, Lord, the fear, the anxieties. We ask you to please come and be the doctor of doctors to them. At this point, Lord, we want to thank you for all the blessings of life that we have enjoyed. If we are going to count each one of them, there are too many, Lord. Continue to pour your blessings upon your children. We pray now for thy servant, our pastor, Pastor John. You have chosen him, Lord, to lead this congregation. Continue to favor him with good health, with divine wisdom, with long life. Bless his family as he is going to bring your word to each one of us. I pray that you will connect his mind to your mind, that the words of his mouth might come from you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Continue to be with each one of us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath. Ellen White wrote this in her book, Patriarchs and Prophets. Noah did not forget him by whose gracious care they had been preserved. His first act after leaving the ark was to build an altar, an offer from every kind of clean beast and fowl, a sacrifice, thus manifesting his gratitude to God for deliverance, and his faith in Christ, the great sacrifice. This offering was pleasing to the Lord, and a blessing resulted. The Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. While the earth remaineth, sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. In like manner, it should be our first care to render our free will offerings to God. Every manifestation of his mercy and love toward us should be gratefully acknowledged, both by acts of devotion and by gifts 
to his cause. At this time, I'm going to call the deacons forward to collect the tithes and offerings, during which time we will be favored by music from Mr. Kevin Daniel.
heads for prayer. Our most gracious, loving, kind, and merciful Father in heaven, giver of life and provider of everything that we have, Father, we want to praise you and thank you for allowing us this opportunity to be with you on another sacred Sabbath day and to be here in that sanctuary to worship you as well as the ones who have chosen to worship with us online. Father, we know about the things that we see going on around us that we are living in the last days. I ask you to please bless the tithes and offerings that have been collected this morning. Multiply them, use them for thy cause, and bless the ones who were unable to give. Forgive us each one our sins and shortcomings. And finally, grant us all a place in your eternal kingdom for I ask all these blessings in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, and now the children can come forward for the children's story, which will be told by my beautiful wife of 23 years, Caroline. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. I'm so happy to see your, well, some of your smiling faces, some are under the mask, but I'm so happy to see you all. For the adults who are here behind us, I've been going through the 28th Seventh-day Adventist Beliefs every time I get an opportunity to tell the story to children. So today, we're going to talk about how we can be just like Jesus. Okay, so let's play a game. It's a guessing game, okay? Can you guess what kind of pet I have? 
My pet likes to play sometimes. She races around the room as if she's chasing something I cannot see. She likes to take a nap in the bright sunshine by the window. She eats and drinks from bowls on the kitchen floor. And when she wants to go outside, she scratches on the door. Can you guess what kind of pet I have? All right. A cat? Okay, let me give you more clues, okay? Let me give you more clues. She doesn't, she doesn't chase cars or dig holes under the fence. So when I throw a stick, she won't chase it and bring it back to me. She has a scratching post. And sometimes she likes to jump on top of my refrigerator and sit. Did you guess again? That's right, it's a cat. Okay, at first, I could have been describing a dog or a cat by some of the clues, but dogs do not chase sticks and they never like to climb up on the refrigerator. You could tell my cat, my, my pet is a cat by the way she behaved, right? By the things she did or she didn't do. Being a Christian is like that too. You can tell who is following Jesus by the things they do and the things they don't do. There is a Bible text that says, whoever says that he lives in God must live as Jesus lived. That means we should be kind and helpful and friendly just like Jesus was. Because Jesus was never selfish, we shouldn't be selfish either. We should think about others first, just as Jesus did. Because we love Jesus, we want to do things that will make us more like him. Sometimes people wear maybe wild clothes or some jewelry just to get attention. But the Bible says it's not our fancy hair. It's not our gold jewelry or fine clothes that should make you beautiful. No, where does your beauty come from? From inside of you. The beauty of a gentle, quiet spirit that, will, be, that will never be destroyed and is very precious to God. Christians are careful about what they eat and drink because they want to take care of their body God has given them. They don't do drugs or they don't drink alcohol or smoke, right? They make healthy decisions. We try to get plenty of exercise and eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Christians like to have fun, but not the kind of fun that hurts other people or the kind that leads us from Jesus. We want the things to make us laugh. And the kinds of things that make us laugh should also make Jesus laugh, don't you think? We want whatever we watch or read or hear to be more like Jesus. Now, I have some things in this bag here. I'm going to need a few volunteers, okay? Not all of you. I'm going to call up one, and you're going to tell me if it's good for you or if it's bad for you, okay? All right. So let's do, I don't know your name, but yes. One at a time. Don't look in the bag, okay? okay? Yeah, pretend you're blindfolded. All right, come close to me, otherwise you can't. Okay, I'll put the bag up. All right, take something from the bag. Reach your hand in there and take something. And tell me if it's good or bad for you. Take it up. What's that? It's water. What would you do with water? Uh, I'll drink it. Is it good for you? Yeah, it's good for me. All right, next person. Uh, let's do a girl. Come, yeah. <laughs> okay, you want to reach in here and see what's in there? We just have a, okay, what is this? A shoe. Is it good for you? Yes. What would you do with a shoe? Uh, run with the shoe. You'd get lots of exercise, right? Okay, let's do another boy. Okay, after him, okay? Come. What's that? A football. Is, how could that be good for you? F 
for throwing exercise. Uh huh. It was for exercise, right? Okay, we just have a few more because I want to give everyone someone. Uh, there's, there's a little girl who said, "The baby." <laughs> the baby wants to participate, so we'll give her a turn. I and you want to go? Come, you sit here. Uh, he's going to go next. Okay. All right. Let's see. What, what can the baby get? Oh no. <laughs> what is that? You know, she's a baby, so we'll help her out. So what is this? Anyone know? It's, it, 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 it's, it's, mat it's matches. Do you think that's good for you to play with? What, it, what could it do? Yeah, it could catch on, you know, you could get things on fire and burn. Okay, now you can sit with me or you can go back to your seat. All right. Come here. Come what is that? That's orange. Is it good for you? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You can take it if you want. Okay, two more. All right, come on. I don't know your name, so I'm so sorry. Otherwise, I would have called you up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, take two more. So, What's that? Apple. Apple. Is that good for you? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And last one. Me. Me. Jonathan. Sorry. Jonathan, come. Me. 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 All right, Jonathan. What is that? Take that. What is that, honey? A scissors. It's a scissors. Do you think it's good? It's good for some things, right? Yes, and you could hurt someone. Okay, so boys and girls, as we begin a new week, and when you go to school or be with your friends, I want you to be more mindful of what comes out of your mouth, your words, your actions, how you behave towards your brothers and sisters, how obedient you are towards your, your mommy and daddy, right? You want to be more like Jesus every day. So, can I have someone come and pray, volunteer to pray? Come. She's been raising her hand. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you gave us. And help us have a good day at Sabbath. And thank you for everything you've done. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Have a good Sabbath. Oh, my God. 
Jesus, hold my hand. For I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Vijay and Sadhana, thank you so much for blessing with this song and also the musicians for the talents that you're using for God's glory. May the Lord richly bless all of you as you continue to serve the Lord. Came in Daniel. I'm, now I know I'm pronouncing, I'm getting your right, last name right. We want to thank you for blessing with the song. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. What a mighty God we have who came and died for us on the cross of Calvary. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. May the Lord richly bless you as you continue to use your talents for God's glory. I'd like to join hands with the pastoral team and the elders of the Redmond Church to welcome all of you for a divine hour. We are so hyped that you have chosen to worship with us. May the Lord richly bless all of us. You have come to the right place to worship the right God to get the right answer. And I want to rejoice in the Lord and I trust that you will also rejoice in the Lord because Apostle Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That is God's instruction to us. We do have a few people's name that I have here. We are happy to have Ellen and Willie here. And also, we are so delighted to have Nirmala Chawan, the mother of Vijay and Sanjay Chavan, that she's able to join us from India. Avinash, we are happy that you could join us. Colette, Adrian Morris, Denise and uh, Mr. Benjamin, 
then Madhu, Judy, and Sarita, and their granddaughter, Mr. and Mrs. Jay Kumar Daniel, friends of Ethiopian Church, we want you to know that we don't take your presence for granted. We are so happy that you could join us from week to week. Jefferson, Suas, and Mary, we are so happy that all of you could join us here for our divine hour. We do have a number of people who are worshiping the live broadcast. The excellent family the Remnant Church, we have John Graves, Esther Singh from Virginia, Ruth Richmond, Dow Taylor, Mary Patrice from Pennsylvania, Dow Taylor, of course, from Canada, Yvonne Hernandez from Philadelphia, Mike, then Ponzi from Nairobi, Kenya, then we have Cordiella from Milan, it Italy, then we have Jonas Kumar from Bombay, India, Rachel Rajan, Lillian from Philadelphia, Charlotte McNeil from Cape Town, South Africa, Grace Justin from Houston, Texas, then we have from the Blue Mountains uh, in Sydney, Australia, we have Maxuga. And then we have Kenwa Allen from Idaho and then Linda Grass from Colorado Springs, Colorado. We are so happy that you could join us from different parts of the world. Certainly the technology has made it possible for us to come together and worship and praise God, regardless of the space and time that we might be separated from one another. We praise God for you. May the Lord richly bless you. This morning, the flowers that you find here are presented to us from Madhu, Judy, the children, the grandchildren. To thank God for his abundant blessings. Judy, we're so happy that we can see you here. She went to pay her last respect to her sister who passed away in India. And because of the COVID, she was stuck up in India for quite some time. But the Lord had been gracious to you and brought you safely here. We praise God for that. And Madhu and uh, Judy, we're so happy that you're celebrating another wedded anniversary. May the Lord richly bless you. Thank you so much for your love and fellowship. May this new year be a wonderful year, a godly year, where all of you as a family, along with your children and grandchildren, can have a closer walk with you. Last week, we did have our uh, associate pastor, Pastor Michael Pedin, being introduced to the congregation and to the, to the extended family at large. We are so happy that you could be part of our pastoral team. And since uh, the, the program is a little lengthy, I did not take time to make a mention about this. And it is my desire to share this burden with you. The work of a pastor is to share the joys and burdens with the congregation. Now, when we worked on getting an associate pastor for the Remnant Church, and the Fordham was then alive, came forward and said, uh, Pastor, I did talk to the treasurer and to the secretary, and we are able to set aside half the budget for your associate pastor. So I told him, Pastor Fordham, no family can exist on half salary. Because we got to meet the needs of the family at, uh, at large. So we prayed about it. Personally, I thought about it, prayed about it, and then the Lord impressed upon my mind to make a proposal to the conference executive committee that we as a church would come forward for the first one year only a certain portion of the pastor's salary. And so we made this proposal, and that was uh, an easy thing for Pastor Fordham to sell it in the executive committee, and that was on that condition that they agreed to have come on board full time. So from May 4th is on the payroll of the Allegheny Conference. So for all, in all practical purposes, starting with this month, month of May, Remnant Church have to send to the conference every month for the next 12 months, $2,500. So here is my request to you. Now before I make a request, let me just make one little comment. Don't take from Paul and give to Peter. <laughs> in other words, whatever you are committed to the Lord, whatever you are sacrificing to the Lord that you have been giving faithfully month after month, continue to do so. But beyond that, my earnest plea, not only to you, within the four walls of the sanctuary, even the ones who are worshipping in different parts of this country and around the world, you are welcome to join with us because there is a beautiful saying, little drops of water makes a mighty worship. So if all of us can come together, certainly we'll be able to raise beyond what all of us are giving towards that pastor's salary for the first 12 months. So it's my prayer that the good Lord will impress upon your mind to give sacrificially so that we will have no problem. In fact, just last week, the previous week, in fact, 
the treasurer of the conference and the secretary of the conference came and met me in my office. And after discussing various concerns, treasurer's mind is always on money. So he turned to me and said, Pastor, uh, do you remember what the amount that you need to send? I said, 2,500. Oh, I remember that, he said. Trying to remind me, make sure you keep the commitment. So I told him, Pastor, by God's grace, we will keep our side of our bargain and we will surely meet the commitment because God has been good to us. And so may I appeal to you, please join with us. And uh, beyond what you are giving, contribute. So the ministry of Pastor Michael Pedrin can be multiplied and many more can be brought to the foot of the cross. Amen. It's always true. God loves you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. The scripture reading this morning is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, the last chapter, verse 11 and 12. And it reads, Put on the whole armor of God, that it may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. May the Lord bless his word. of God is taken from Ephesians chapter 6 and I'm going to read verse 12 that was read by Dariana. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual darkness in high places. Merciful Father in heaven, as we linger a little longer in your presence, as we open your word, we plead with you, loving Father, that you take control of our very being. Open our hearts to you. May we shut our eyes to the world so that we will receive the blessing for which we have come here into thy holy sanctuary. Please, loving Father, breathe your spirit upon the message that has been prepared, that it might help us in a walk with you. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Pastor Doug McCoy tells us the story of one of his elders while he was pastoring a church in Ohio. He was very active in church activities. He contributed much to the spiritual growth of the church. In his role as an elder, he spoke about the errors that he found. He also stood against the false doctrines and practices that were slowly creeping into the church. As a result, there were some in the church who didn't want to associate with this elder. One fine day, his wife walked out of his life, which he had been planning for quite some time. And when the news spread, many in the congregation were surprised by what happened to this elder. He was devastated because he loved his wife very dearly. He was concerned about what would happen to his children. He was also concerned about what the people in the, in the church would start saying about him. And so he decided to go and meet with the pastor. So he met him in his office, talked to him, 
and explain to him the bitter experience that he is going through as an elder, as a member, as an individual. And having said what he had to say, he said, Pastor, I'm sure now people in the church are going to use this against me. There's something against me to talk about. They're going to exploit me. They might even shun me or shut me down. They might exploit my situation. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, just like this elder in this story, you and I, every minute of our lifetime, are engaged in a spiritual battle. And since we are engaged in a spiritual, ba spiritual battle, we have an enemy. The arch enemy, that is the Satan. He this takes great pressure in trying to suppress us, in to expose our weaknesses and our shortcomings. He delights in that. He delights to pounce upon us day in and day out. Which is true today, and it was true during the time of Zechariah. In our last meditation, we saw how in chapter 1, Zechariah was told to talk about the, re the purpose why the children of Israel have to return back to Jerusalem and also return back to God and how they need to learn from the past experience of the forefathers. In chapter 2, we learned that God had impressed upon Zechariah to write about the promise of God's presence being with us even in the worst of times. Now as we move to chapter 3 of Zechariah, the Lord is impressing upon the mind in a form of a vision. That is the fourth vision that Zechariah had. And in that vision, the Lord says to him, Zechariah, I've called you to be a prophet, to speak words of comfort, words of encouragement to my people. Come with me as we prayfully meditate Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. And may I submit to you for our consideration and for our meditation three cardinal truths that we must acknowledge in order to fight the devil and be victorious at the end. Because the forces of evil and the forces of good are fighting. And let me tell you, your mind and our mind and my mind is the battleground between the evil forces and the forces of God. And as such, at the end, we want to gain victory over Satan. And for that, this portion of God's word lays out before us three cardinal truths. Kindly turn your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3 and we will read verse 1 together. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1. Here is the first cardinal truth that we need to embrace. Acknowledge that Satan is the enemy. And the word of God reads for us in Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. Join with me as we read this. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to do what? To resist him. You find that here in chapter 1, here in the very first verse, we see that uh, Zechariah in the fourth vision is shown in that vision Joshua. He is the central figure in this vision. And the Lord is showing Zechariah and he sees Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord and he was the first high priest to be chosen after the children of Israel returned back from captivity back to Jerusalem. And if you read Zechariah chapter 1 and if you read Hagar chapter 1, you get a clear idea about the spiritual condition of the children of Israel. It was extremely low. It was something that they stood in in want. They were not in line. They were not up to God's desire. After all, for 70 years, they have been in captivity in Babylon. No temple to go and visit. No priest to nurture them in the, in the, in, in the spiritual growth. And to make it worse, for the 70 years, the influence of the Babylonian heathen culture was very strong among the people of Israel. And so they followed the customs, the practices, and the traditions of the Babylonians rather than what the Lord had commanded them to do so in his word in Torah or the word that the Lord had had for them through his prophets. And now that they have returned back to Jerusalem, the Lord picks up Joshua and makes him as the high priest and gives him the task to revive, to refresh 
the spiritual life of the people of Israel in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Israel. And he was to do so by doing two things. Number one, to complete the rebuilding of the temple and to revive the temple services, which they were not doing it all those 70 years they were in Babylon. And before that, the temple was already destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Please grasp this important truth. In this fourth vision that you see here in chapter 3, I want this to be back of your mind as we go through this important chapter. It is a court scene. Let me see the hands of those who have ever been to a court. Not a good place to go, but if you have to go, you have to go. <laughs> All right, here's what it is. In any court, you do have the judge. You have a defendant. You also have a prosecutor. And that is what we find here. God is the judge. Joshua the high priest is the defendant. And Satan is the prosecutor. He seems to have a strong case against Joshua the high priest. I want you to keep in mind, when you talk about Joshua the high priest, we are not talking about just him as an individual. He is standing before the Lord and Satan by his right hand to resist him because he finds something wrong with him. That he is wicked, he is wretched, he is sinful. And so he is representing the whole human race. He represents you and me today in this vision. And so he, he accuses not just Joshua, but he's making the accusation that everyone, everyone that you created and placed upon this earth are sinful, they're wretched, they're wicked. Case in point, if you read 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 13, you get a little glimpse of what happened, what was existing even before they went, they went to Babylon in captivity. If you can have that verse on the screen. And follow me as we read this. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. Let me give you the historical background here. The last king to rule over Judah before they were taken as captive was King Zedekiah. He is the one who rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon. And if you read the story very well, you notice that the king ordered for his eyes to be plucked out. He became blind. He rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him to swear by God. But what did Zedekiah and the children of Israel do? The verse says very clearly, they stiffened their neck, and what else? They hardened their hearts from turning towards or unto the, God, the Lord God of Israel. They refused to turn, them, turn their mind, turn their heart towards God. Instead, they showed their back to God, and they hardened their hearts, and they stiffened their neck, and they did not follow. That was the condition of the children of Israel even before they were taken into captivity. In fact, that was the cause why God had to send them to captivity because they refused to return back to God. And the sad part of the story, dearly beloved, that the same kind of behavior, attitude, or the spiritual life continued even while they were in Babylon for 70 years. And still worse, when they returned from, from Babylon after 70 years, their spiritual life was still found wanting. That is why the Lord is having to pick up Zechariah, make him a prophet, and give him the sound counsel to give it to the children of Israel and to us today. Just to give a little example. The merchants during this time charge very high interest rates. The priest who was supposed to protect God's treasury was stealing from the sanctuary. Wickedness prevailed in every look and corner of the society. That was the prevailing condition of the people at that time. Now let's look into verse 1. If you look into verse 1 here, it says that here, tip, if you can have Zechariah chapter, chapter 3 verse 1. And he showed me who? Joshua the high priest, standing where? Before the angel of the Lord, and you find that who was standing right next to him? Satan. Satan. And what was he trying to do? Yes. To resist. Now the word resist means to oppose or to accuse. Interestingly, the Adventist scholars in Andrews University Bible Commentary, page 10, 1142, make this, com make this observation. 
The verb oppose or accuse is derived from the same Hebrew root word for the name Satan. And that is why the Bible also talks about Satan as what? The accuser of the brethren. And so the word accuse or oppose is synonymous with the name Satan or the devil because he is our arch enemy. And so he is the one standing there and he is the one resisting. Here is what I want you to keep in mind. This devil, the arch enemy, Satan, who brought about the downfall of the children of Israel is very real today. And here is the practical aspect of this part of the message. It is high time that we recognize every minute of our lifetime who the enemy that we are fighting against. Because he comes in sheep clothing, the Bible declares. If you are not grounded in the truth, if you don't know what is right and wrong, if everything looks okay, then the danger is that you're going to compromise before you even realize it. Just let me give you a little example. Right now there's a war taking place between Ukraine and Russia. If there's one thing the military generals of either, part, either armies look forward to is reports, intelligence report. And what is the purpose of the intelligence report? To give you a clue, an idea what the enemies are planning. And based on the information that you get, you begin to make your own planning. You have your own strategy now because you have some information that your enemies are doing and you are able to counter attack, count, make counter moves. That is true even in the sports world. Whether you talk about soccer or basketball or football or whatever it is, you, along with their practice that they involve themselves in, the coaches and the players, they sit behind, they sit in their office or sit in a room and they have a screen before them and they sit and watch the game of the opposition team that they are fighting, they are going to play against. Why? Because they want to see the strength and the weaknesses of that opposite team. And by seeing what it is, the coach and the players can come together and say, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. If that is true in the sports world, if it is true in the, mili in the military world, how true it is in a spiritual bat. It is only when you know that Satan is your real enemy. This is what he's trying to do. And that you begin to realize by reading God's word. Because it gives you every kind of a counsel that you and I need. And then we are able to armor ourselves, protect ourselves defend ourselves and come out victorious. And that is why I said the first cardinal truth is we got to acknowledge that Satan is our real enemy. Here is a cunning device that Satan uses. When Satan wants to talk about God to you, he lies. But when he wants to talk to God about you, he tells you the truth. Look at the example of Eve in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago. When he came and he began to talk about God, he said, oh, did God say not to eat this fruit? And what did he say at the end? No, you're not going to die, but you're going to be like God's. He was, that's exactly what he does. But when he appears before God, like in the case of Job, or in the case of Joshua here, in the vision that Zechariah had, is exposing how wicked and wretched Joshua is. That is what he do, does. And that is the reason why the sooner we acknowledge the strength and the weakness of the enemy that we are fighting against, then you begin to have every kind of weapon that you need to have to fight against him. And of course, in the spiritual battle, God and his word is our defense. In SD Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1092, 1092, Adventist scholars have this to comment on this. Follow me. He, that is Satan, pointed to the transgression of Israel as a reason why the people should not be given what? A divine favor. 
That is his, his attack. He says, they have transgressed God. You made the laws. They have broken all ten, not once, not ten, not ten times, not one thousand times, much more in their lifetime. And so they don't deserve any kind of a favor from you. Ellen White drives home the same truth in, Prof, in, in Patriots and Prophets, page 583, where she again drives home this point. She says, Satan determined to put forth still further effort for what? To weaken and to discourage God's people by holding before them what? Their, this is what he does, their imperfections of character. To make you feel miserable, that you are worthless, that you have gone too far in your sinful life. There is no way God is going to accept you. So move on. Do what you have to do. Make yourself happy. Enjoy the world. This is the enticement that Satan comes with. And that is the reason why we got to acknowledge that he is our enemy. And we got to fight him. And fight him with all force that God gives at your command. Amen. Here's another cunningness of Satan. Cunning device. He makes us to feel guilty and then to ex go through the ex experience of remorse and sorry, but not repentance. A classic example that we have in the Bible is Judas. After he had betrayed the Lord, he was remorseful. He was sorry. He never thought that Jesus would surrender himself in the Garden of Gethsemane to the Roman soldiers. He thought that I'm going to get this 30 pieces of silver. I'm going to go and tell the master, see how well I worked it out. We have got 30 pieces of silver to take care of our needs for the next few months. But never did he realize, in spite of God, Jesus Christ telling him that he came not to establish an earthly kingdom, but to establish an heavenly kingdom. He was remorseful, but he never repented. Whereas Peter was remorseful, but he didn't stop there, but he also repented. And so there was a right about turn in the life of Peter, but not in the life of Judas. Why does he do so? Here is the cunning device. When he begins to make us feel guilty and remorseful and not repent, then our focus, our attention, dearly beloved, is on ourselves. How miserable we are, how guilty we are, how worthless we are, instead of focusing on what God's power of forgiveness can do for us. And that is why I read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 that we started off with. For we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers of the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the kind of battle that you and I are involved in. We don't pick up a gun to go and fight, nor do we pick up a sword to go and fight, but we are fighting against principalities, against powers of the rulers of the darkness of this world. And as such, we got to know our enemy and we got to protect ourselves and be able to defend ourselves. And that brings to my second important uh, cardinal truth that we find in this part of God's word. Kindly turn your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3 and we will read verse 4 together. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 4 together. And the word of God reads, And he answered, join with me. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. That is again. They are standing before the angel of the Lord, saying what? Take, Take away the filthy garment from him. And unto him he said, what? Behold, I have caused what? That iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with what? With the change of raiment. In verse 1, we saw the first cardinal truth. In for us to win the spiritual battle. And it is simply this. Acknowledge that Satan is the enemy. Know his cunning plans and fight him. Because his whole purpose, dearly beloved, is to destroy us and not to build us up. But now in verse 4, we have the second cardinal truth. And it is this. Acknowledge that Christ is our friend and as such is our answer. In the spiritual battle, he is our friend. He is looking out for you because his sole purpose in your life and in my life is not to destroy us, but to build us up. And that is why I read in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have what? 
life and i will have more abundantly he didn't come here to destroy you he didn't come here to destroy me but he came to give us life and not just ordinary life but abundant life in the lord jesus christ that is the god that we serve and worship pause ponder reflect and if you can have that verse on the screen continuously and we'll come back to that a little later see the progression of truth with regard to god's love god's mercy god's grace towards you and me that is so beautifully portrayed in this passage of scripture consider verse 2 now zechariah chapter 3 and verse 2 Follow me here. Here is the context. Joshua, the high priest, that represents all of us as sinners, is standing before the Lord, and Satan is standing right next to him, and he is resisting him, he is opposing him, he is accusing him that he is the sinner, worthless. He is not worthy to receive any kind of a favor. Again, I want you to picture in your mind the court scene. Remember, Satan is the prosecutor. You are the defendant. The Lord is the judge. He's before as he makes that accusation against us as the defendants. Before you say a word, before I say a word, the Lord steps forward and he accuses and he rebukes Satan. What a mighty God! That's an act of mercy, my friend. That is an act of grace. That without you prompting, without you and asking, without any action on your part. the lord steps forward and he rebukes satan look at verse here now in verse 2 what does he say and the lord said unto satan the lord rebuke thee god takes the initiative because the love for you and me is beyond measure he says i cannot stand back in silence and watch my child being crushed down by my enemy by his enemy and so i'm going to step forward i'm going to defend him i'm going to protect him because i'm his advocate i'm his mediator that is what the lord jesus christ is doing for you and me every minute of his of our existence daily beloved when we are down and out when we are tempted and we are crushed the lord does not stand back as a silent spectator but is an active participant in your life and in my life and he wants to lift you up and say i did not die for you so that you will be destroyed i died for you so that you will live and live eternally and that is what we find here in fact in ellen white in prophets uh, patriarchs and Pro- prophets and kings i'm sorry prophets and king page 580 84 she has this to say then the angel who is christ himself the savior of sinners puts to silence the accuser of his people by declaring the lord rebuke thee there are two things that we need to notice in this in this quote from ellen white number one she identifies who that angel is remember in that vision that zechariah had you have joshua the high priest standing before the angel and this aspect this particular court makes it very plain that the angel was not just one of the thousands of angels that god has in heaven no he is christ himself he is your advocate there just like the prosecutor is fighting his case instead of because i am the defendant and you are the defendant god jesus christ stands right next to me and he becomes my defense attorney fighting for us that is what we find here and what does he do he puts to silence and says not only rebukes and says you be quiet satan you know why because you might say all you want to, but i'm going to declare i rebuke you because i am the god of the universe Amen. look at the second part of the verse let's in second part of the verse if you notice that satan has no pride to that in 587 the very same author prophets and kings page 587 look at what ellen white says here satan has no power or whom to pluck them out of the hand of the same 
He has no power. Not one soul who in penitence and faith has claimed his protection and the last part says what? Will Christ permit for that and to, for, to come under the, to pass under the enemy's power? What a comforting words of assurance for us. He has no power. Yes, he can make all the accusations that he want. The Lord rebuked him to begin with. He recognized that that angel is Jesus himself. And now he says, I am the angel. I am the one who made him. I am the one who sustained him. I am the one who have redeemed him. And I am there to be there for him till the very end. And he is not, I am not going to stand back in silence and allow you to accuse him and keep accusing him. Look at verse 3 now. You see the progression of truth. In verse 3 you find that, and Joshua is standing there what? With filthy garments. What you find now, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Now, in the Bible, when you talk about filthy garments, immediately think of Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. What does it say? Our righteousness are as what? As filthy rags. So, Joshua standing there with filthy rags talks about the sinful condition of him. But the good news is this. Look at verse 4 now that we talked about. He's standing there, accused by Satan, filthy garments, sinful as he is. And now the Lord says in verse 4, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying what? To the other angels that were there, ordinary angels that was there, Christ is commanding, take away the filthy garments from him. Here's the good news. The Lord not only shows his love by speaking on your behalf, he does not leave you where you are. If you are in the mighty clay of sin, he does not say, I always think of this uh, story of uh, a, a, a man who had fallen into the pit. It's a Chinese story that took place in China. And then you find a priest passes by, he says, I'm so sorry you have fallen into the pit. When you come up, make sure you don't go back to the pit. <laughs> but then, when Christ came along, he felt sorry for the man who was in the pit. He knelt down, stretched his hand towards the man, had a strong grip, and picked him out of the that is the difference between our Lord and all the false gods that the rest of the world worships. That is what you find here. He says, and he told the angel, take away the filthy garments. But the good news is, that look at the second part of the verse. Not only does the Lord take away the filthy garments and leave you naked, but he does not leave you naked, but what does he do? Look at the next part. And clothe him and cause, and then he says, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. That means I have removed the sins, have justified you. You are washed, you are cleansed, you are purified. You stand before me sinless because I have, my precious blood has washed you and made you clean. And the last part of the verse, what does it say? And I clothed you with a change of raiment. Yeah. Ellen White talking about this, if you can have that, uh, that, word, that from page 587 of Prophets and Kings, she says this. Satan has no power, but if you have the next one, this is from 587. All right. Here's, here's another one while, they, while they're looking for the text, or the quote. Helen White says there, as he stood before that, the man in his filthy garments, you find the divine intervention Saul, Joshua's problem. This is taken from Adventist Bible Commentary, the Andrews University Bible Commentary, page 1142, where the Adventist scholars commenting on this say that Joshua in filthy garments is only solution to the problem was a divine intervention. And that is what we find here. If you look in very, through your, though your sins, be, and then you find that, talking about us. Let me make a, a, a good comparison, a good practical application to us. Although this account was written to us thousands of years ago, I want you to keep in mind time and time again, it is very relevant to our times. Mm -hmm. 
at all times. Because it's a two-edged sword and it meets every one of our demands today. And that is where you find that here the Lord is telling us in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. King David, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, he sits down and writes that beautiful words of Psalm, Psalm 51, where he begins to cry out and say, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and transgressed against thee. And in verse 7 he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. That is God's promise. He does not allow you to stay in the pit. He drags you out. He washes you. He clothes you. And he empowers you. And he says, stand on the solid rock that is me. And move on in your life. That is what the Lord is giving the message to us here. Now, here is what I would like to keep in mind. I want you to know this. I came across this beautiful story of Martin Luther. I was reading his biography. The great reformer of the Protestant Reformation that shook the whole European countries. One day he had a dream. And in the dream, he saw Satan standing right in front of him with a long scroll and reading all the sins that Martin Luther had committed. And in the dream, Martin Luther says, he jumped up and said, it is true. Satan, every one of them are true. And there are many more sins that you don't know, but my God knows. <laughs> and then he says in that biography, he says, then at the end of the scroll, I saw this verse written, the blood of Jesus Christ. And then with great courage, Martin Luther says in the dream, he shouted at Satan and said, Jesus' blood has washed all my sins. And in the next scene he says, Satan fled. He ran for his life, so to say. Because when God is on your side, when you're washed, when God is present by you, because he's in Emmanuel, God with us, there is no way Satan can be in that presence. Because Satan cannot be present in the presence of a holy God in your life and in my life. And that is why we usually sing the song, into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. He has to abide in us. He has to have a permanent residence, not a visitor. He is not someone who comes in and goes out. He must be a permanent resident. He must be a citizen of your life, so to say. Because above green card, you have the citizenship here. So don't be just satisfied with a, with a green card. But have Jesus be the citizen of your life, where he rules over your life, not just on the Sabbath hours, not just when everything is going well, but in, at, at every crossroads, Jesus Christ must be the Lord of your life and Lord of my life. And that brings me to my third important uh, cardinal truth. Kindly turn your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3 and we will read verse, verse 7. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 7. And the word of God reads, Thus say the Lord of hosts. What does he say? If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also do what? Judge my house, and then what? And then rule my court. Then what's going to do? What, what is he promising? I will give you these places that you can walk among them that stand by. In verse 1, we saw the first cardinal truth, daily beloved, for us to fight the devil in the spiritual battle, we got to acknowledge that Satan is our real enemy. In, and his business is to destroy you and not to build you up. In verse 4, we saw the second cardinal truth. It is that Christ is our friend and he is the answer for our struggles. He is the answer for our problems that we can overcome through him. Because his business he is to build us up and not destroy us. Because he came to give us life and give more abundantly. Now in verse 7, we see a third cardinal truth that we need to embrace and acknowledge in order to be victorious at the end of our life journey in the spiritual battle. It is simply this, dearly beloved. God's promises 
are always steadfast. It does not waver. It is not changed. It cannot go away. It is here today and gone tomorrow. No. Because the one who made the promise is eternal. And as such his promises are eternal. Just in this verse. Verse 7 if you can have it on the screen. As I emphasize the next three points. The Lord lays before us the formula. The way. The path. The steps that we can take. The first part of the verse says what? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, contrary to what the world assumes, contrary to what the world believes, that all roads lead to Rome, that all religions are good, that all religions at the end of your life journey is going to give you heaven, a moksha, a paradise. That is not true, dearly beloved, because of all the people that have ever lived on the face of the earth from Adam to the present and even till Jesus comes the second time, there's only one person who has made this bold claim. In John chapter 14, verse 6, where the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Not Buddha, not Guru Nanak, not Mahavi, not any other religious leader who has ever lived upon this earth, has made this kind of a bold claim, saying that I am the way. Not one of the ways, but I am the way. The one and the only way that we have. And that's what the Lord says here, that if thou wilt walk in my ways, acknowledge Jesus as your savior, even the ones who are joining us in different parts of the world, whatever you are, for some reason, if you have not accepted Jesus as Savior, may I plead with you, may I urge you, that Jesus is the only way. For I read in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is no other name given, and I haven't given among, given among men, whereby he might be saved. No one else can save you, dearly beloved. Only Jesus Christ can save you, because he's the only one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Look at the second part of the verse here. If thou wilt walk in thy ways and keep my statutes, meaning that you are faithful in performing the duties that the Lord places in your hand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Apostle Paul has this counsel for us. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do for what? Do all for the glory of God. And so remind yourself, whether your boss is watching you or not, whether anyone else is watching you or not, whether your teacher or a nurse or a doctor or, a, or whatever the profession that you're in, that you are supposed to glorify God because the text says very clearly, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever, it is all inclusive, all comprising. Say, make sure you glorify God. Make sure you're tuned with God's word. And so the Lord says, if thou wilt walk in my ways because I am the way, and if you keep my statute, that you're faithful in giving glory to him in everything that you do, here's the promise. Promise that is steadfast. Promise that is firm. Promise that is constant. Promise that is consistent. Promise that can never change. The Lord says that I will give you a place that you can walk among by, by the ones who are standing by. In fact, I have been this Adventist scholars in SD by in uh, in Andrews University Bible Commentary, page 1140, they say, talking about among them. Who are among them? He says, it is a place among the heavenly beings present in this vision. It is not just ordinary fellow human beings. But the Lord says, the place that I'm going to give you, you're going to dwell among heavenly beings. Yes, it's going to be among Abel. It's going to be among Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Elijah, Elisha. Go through the list that you have in Hebrew chapter 11. He talks about Barg, he talks about Deborah, he talks about Samson, he talks about David. We will be able to live among them and join with the rest before whom? Before the sea of glass and sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. That is the promise the Lord gives to us now. If you walk in my ways, 
And if you do what I've asked you to do and keep your, my statutes, my commandments, and do what is best in your life, I'm going to promise you this eternal life where you can live among them. I love the way Ellen White sums it up so beautifully. Let me sum it up there in Prophets and Kings, page 590. A very profound paragraph. She says here, O oh Satan, I gave my life to these souls. They are engraved upon the palm of my hands. And look at the next part of the verse. They may have imperfection of character. They have may have failed in their endures, but they have repented and have pardoned and accepted them. Amen. What a promise. What a God that we have. A God who is able to step in. A God who is able to give you this assurance. Rebuke Satan and said, I have died for them. Yes, they may have imperfection of character. Yes, they might have failed in their endeavors. Yes, they might have fallen 1,000 times. It does not matter because every time when they fell, when they repented, I accepted their repentance. I pardoned them and have empowered them to live on. And so, dearly beloved, whatever your struggles and your challenges are, what are your doubts and your anxieties and apprehensions are, whatever your pain or your suffering, whatever the sickness that you might have, not knowing what awaits you. Some of you will be going for some test this afternoon. Whatever it is, I want to plead with you. You need to embrace this God who is your friend, whose promises are steadfast, never wavering. Because the battle is real, God is real, in God victory is sure and certain. In the Toronto Museum, they depict a story of a man named Sisekel, who was more commonly known as Crowfoot. He was the chief of the six Silk Seeker Indian tribe. While the Canadian Railroad was the Pacific Canadian Railroad was being built. As they made the markings as to how the track should go through, they realized that they have to go through a vast piece of land that belongs to Crowfoot. And so they approached him and they made an appeal, he said, and they made a, made a proposal. I said, Crowfoot, if you can give part of your land for us to build this railroad, we will give you a free pass for all your lifetime. Whenever, wherever you want to travel on the specific railroad throughout Canada, you don't have to buy a ticket, everything is free. He was enticed by the deal and he sat and signed up the agreement. He signed the contract. And once the contract was signed and the railroad was built, there was one problem. Crowfoot, throughout his lifetime, carried that pass that was given in a beautiful case. He hung it around his neck and everywhere he went he said guys look at this. This is what the government gave. I can travel in this train anytime, anywhere and it cost me nothing. But the problem is simply this daily beloved. Crowfoot never stepped into the train throughout his lifetime. He possessed a lifetime pass but never got into the train to experience the joy of traveling in that Canadian railroad train. Likewise, you and I in a spiritual battle, God's promises are written here, clear and crystal. We quote them. We frame them. We put them on the wall. Christ is the head of the house, an unseen guest in every conversation. But we behave in that home as though we are the head of the house and not God is the head of the house. And we even post it on our social media about God's promises. But we fail to accept it and apply it in our lives. What is the use of having the promise of daily beloved if you don't use it? I love the way Charles Spurgeon put it one day. He made this quote. God never gave promises that he never intended for us to use. 
He gave promises so that we would use it. He gave promises that we would believe it. He gave promises that he would embrace it. He gave promises that we claim it. So that at the end, we can say, I have fought a good fight. And henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness. And so as, Josh, as Joash and Rachel sing this beautiful song, I want you to pause, ponder, reflect on the message that the song gives to you. When, he, when Satan tempts you with despair and talks about the guilt within, you look up because Christ died for you to set you free. Yes, my appeal to you this afternoon. Go out of this house of worship and have the assurance Satan has no power to snatch you from the hand of the Savior because God is our friend and in him there is victory. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift his counsel upon you and give you peace. This is my prayer in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship on this beautiful Sabbath morning. We hope all of you were blessed by today's service. As mentioned in today's sermon, Pastor Such John reminds us that we are always engaged in spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our mind is the battleground. God versus Satan. Let us not give Satan the victory. But how do we strengthen our mind? The answer is simple, the Word of God. We must be in the Word, the Bible, if we want to win this battle against the devil. Amen? Christ is our answer, always and forever. In Prophets and Kings, page 587, we read that those who are in Christ, those who believe and accept Christ, Satan has no power, no power. The enemy has no power for those who are in Christ, amen. God is so good. He is our king. He is our protector. He is our helper. He forgive us our sins. Let's turn to Him today. And not just today, but tomorrow. And not just tomorrow, but for always till the end of the age. Amen. Thank you to all of those who have decided to worship with us on this fine Sabbath. We thank you for your continued prayers and financial support to the media ministries here at Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is because of your continue, continued prayers throughout the years that we have been able to function. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would like for you to continue supporting us through your prayers and through your financial giving. Thank you, each and every single one of you, for growing with us and for making this ministry possible. Please join us for our prayer and praise service this evening at 5 p.m., where we can fellowship and sing together and praise God. Until then, God bless you. See you soon.